You read the book? Everybody do their homework? This is an extraordinary book. This is a collection of some of the rabbi's best essays, sermons, and reflections. It's actually wonderful because if you've read his other books like we have together, this is a sort of application of those principles to some of the important issues that he faced in his rabbinate. I would urge you to do two things. One is if you can read through the book, read through the book. And two is if you want, go to the Schulweiss Institute website, which is hmsi.info. If you forget that, just Google Harold M. Schulweiss Institute or Schulweiss Institute. And there you'll find an archive of recordings of the rabbi's major sermons from about 1975 down to the present. Okay, so many of these essays began as sermons. And there's something quite remarkable to hear him give it. Because not only do you get a sense of his language and the arguments and the ideas that you'll find in the essay, but there's an immediacy and the power of his passion for these ideas you'll hear in, as he gives the sermon. And, that's, and it's quite wonderful, if you haven't done this in a long time, to go back and to listen to some of the ones earlier um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the 70, in the 70s and the 80s, um, because you'll hear him, his voice was a little bit different than it is. It was a little higher than it is now um, than it was these last years. And um, he was strong, so his passion came through. I mean, he would sort of like just overwhelm the, uh, the, 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 the congregation. So it's wonderful to get to hear that. So please go and do that, okay? That's your homework assignment following this talk. Tonight, we're going to talk about sex. I know that's why you all came, right? When I was beginning as a congregational rabbi, I discovered that if I wanted to pack a room, all I had to do was put the word sex or the word Jesus in the title. <laughs> and somehow all the Jews came out. And I tried my hardest to try to figure out how to get them both. You know, and I somehow couldn't do that. But that, that's how you do it. So let's begin with a sort of overview of where he comes from, and then we'll take a look at the problems that he's facing. There's a great debate among great historians about whether the man makes the age or the age makes the man. About whether the times that a person lives in shapes and forms the character of the leader who comes, becomes the dominant personality of that age or whether it's the leader who shapes the times he lives in. And of course, they're both true in some certain way. Had Winston Churchill lived in a much quieter time, he wouldn't have been Winston Churchill. But had he not lived when he lived, England would not have won the war. The times and the person interact with each other. One of the things you have to remember about Rabbi Showweis is that his rabbinate coincided with one of the periods of the, one of the greatest periods of social upheaval in all of American history, in all of Jewish history, I think in all of human history. If you consider that he becomes a rabbi in the year 1950, and think about the social changes that have come to life between 1950 and our day, and the movements that he witnessed. And it didn't hurt that his rabbinate begins in Oakland, California, which puts him right where the free speech movement and the counterculture begins in the 60s. The Black Panther Party is formed in Oakland in the 1960s. Right where that happens in the 1960s. And then in 1970, he moves here. So, so many of the social movements that were born and flowered here in Los Angeles. So just think for a moment, what happened between 1950 and, say, 2000? You have the civil rights movement, which upturns the arrangements between races in the United States and declares the equality of African Americans, of black folks and white folks, and changes the way that we think about society. You have the Vietnam War, and then as a product or a result or as a consequence of the Vietnam War, you have a counterculture. You have a whole change in the way that youth relate to their adults. You have an attitude about institutions and about values. In its crudest expression, you have the hippies. Remember, he's in San Francisco in the summer of love, 1967. He actually went, <coughs> excuse me, he went to the San Francisco Federation and asked for funding so he could put on a Passover Seder in Haight-Ashbury 
1967, and the San Francisco Federation turned him down because they said none of those hippies are Jews. <laughs> so he went to the sisterhood at Temple Beth Abraham in Oakland, where he was the rabbi, and asked them to cook a Seder for 200 people. And he took the Seder for 200 people and Seth and went down to the Haight-Ashbury, to the Haight-Ashbury Community Christian Church, and they put posters up on all the phone poles saying a Seder was being held, and a thousand kids showed up. And they stuffed him into this church, and Rabbi Schulweis got up on a table. He stood on a table, and he led the Seder. And the funny story is he said, he walked in, he sees all these kids, and he says, anybody here know Hadgadia? And some kid raises and says, Rabbi, I know Hadgadia. He says, could you lead Hadgadia? He says, yeah, with bongos or without? <laughs> this is, and and you, you understand that, that the middle of this counterculture, here is this rabbi, and he became, by the way, the most popular rabbi on the Berkeley campus. The Berkeley, the Berkeley kids who were involved in their own social revolution would come down to Oakland to hear him, and he made it possible for the Berkeley kids to come and hear him for free on high holidays. He wanted to make sure that the campus knew that the synagogue was open to them. Feminism, the whole relation between the, the nature of gender, the nature of uh, the place of women in society, the, the role of women, changes during this time, right? All kinds of things, politics change at this time. One of the principal changes that, 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 that still affects us now is something that was called at the time the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution changed the mores and values and, and, and practices of, of, of people in, in, with regard to sex. First of all, you could not have had this in the 1950s. No rabbi would ever have gotten up in front of a congregation in the 1950s and even said the word sex. That's what the beginning of the essay is about. Because the world was changing and no rabbi would talk about it. So he wrote an essay, and I think essay is the late 70s, to try to sort of talk about what this means to us. And by the, by in 1961, you have one of the great inventions, the birth control pill. And what did the birth control pill do? It, it, it separated procreation from sex. So that now a woman could control her body, her cycles, and it, can, and it separated procreation from sex. And it yielded that plus the counterculture's attitude, throwing off all the rules of our parents, looking upon our parents as hopelessly bourgeois, repressed Victorian people, and of course, the hero of the counterculture was a man that we very rarely talk about, Benjamin Spock. Now, Benjamin Spock is not Leonard Nimoy. That's a different Mr. Spock. <laughs> I'm talking about Dr. Spock. Who was Dr. Spock? He was, what, what was the name of the book? Baby and Child Caring, what's the name of the book? And every mother in America had the book. And what did Dr. Spock say? You don't put the child on a schedule. You feed the kid when he's hungry. And you pick the kid up. Before that, the notion was discipline your child. You know, you feed him at the right time, and you don't indulge his, uh, his or her moods. Spock said, no, the child is at the center. The child, we have to respond to the child. The kid is hungry, feed him. The kid is cold, make him warm. The kid is nudgy, pick him up and hold him and play with him, engage with your child. Dr. Spock said to a whole generation, me, my generation, you come first. You are the center of the universe. Your needs, desires, impulses need to be met and gratified. And Dr. Spock, and then the Freudians beyond Dr. Spock said that if you repress desires, impulses, and needs, you'll end up with a neurotic child. And who wants a neurotic child? So we grew up, from the time we were very small, being told, in effect, to hate, you know, have what you want. Indulge your impulses, indulge your desires. So the combination of the Counterculture's uh, anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian, anti-bourgeois attitude, and Dr. Spock's indulgence 
gives you a generation that's only too ready to break all the rules. To break all the rules. And the invention of the birth control means you can do it and get away with it. You can do it and get away with it. So whereas in 1960, in the middle 1960s, even up until the 1970s, people were asking, you know, is it right for couples to have sexual relations before they're married? Premarital sex. Today, nobody even asks that question. If I tell you that with very few exceptions, every couple that I marry has been living together for years already before they even come to see me. And in the old days, when I first started, I'm 35 years a rabbi, in the old days when I would ask for their address, they would sort of blush when it turned out they had the same address. Now there's no blush at all. It's expected. It's expected. That's how the world has changed in the last half a century. The sexual revolution separated procreation from sexual relations. It separated sex from all the rules and mores that govern sexual attitudes. It separated sex from marriage. It separated sex from relationships and responsibility. You had an attitude among the hippies of free love, which becomes an attitude in our contemporary world of something called hooking up. Hooking up is, a, is the contemporary way of saying even if I don't know you real well, let's have sex anyway. And, and that's where you've come in a half a century. Now, that's a remarkable institution. Just for a moment, think about this. I, I give a talk. I'm invited every year to give a talk at the Milken High School, the Jewish high school up the street here. And, and I, I, I started giving this talk some years ago, and it, I realized something as I'm standing in front of this group. They're all 16-year-old high school juniors. And I'm saying, you know, they're all cute kids. And I said to them, it's, it occurs to me that you are the first generation of human females to not be protected by a set of societal mores and values that govern the way that men can look at you, approach you, touch you, engage in sexual relations with you. Even my generation, which was this anti-institutional, anti-establishment generation, we still had a certain ethic. Remember this song, Wake Up Little Susie? What year was that? 19, no, it was earlier, later than that, 60 something. Was that the Righteous Brothers? Everly Brothers? Everly Brothers? Yeah, someone who knows something, good. So, the Everly Brothers, Wake Up Little Susie, and the story is the couple went up to Lover's Lane or something, where they were going to make out, right, or whatever they do in Lover's Lane, and they fell asleep. And he, they wake, it's four o'clock in the morning, and he's waking her up and says, I have to get you home, why? Or your, your reputation will be shot. Something bad will happen to you because you'll get a bad reputation. And a girl who was a you know, bad girl with a bad reputation of being sexually generous or easy, depending on which side you're on, was a bad thing to have. And this was already 1965, right? Now, that wake up little Susie is about 1965, 1966, right? You move ahead about 10 years and you have a song by an artist named George Michael called I Want Your Sex. Just right, I, I was, and I know this song well, I'll tell you why. Because I was a camp director at Camp Ramah, and I was driving a group of teenagers to a camp out, and I had the radio on, and, the, and that song came on. I want your sex. And I said, I was shocked. I almost like turned the car off the road. I was like, my God, how can I try to turn it off? And the kid said, no, Rabbi, put it back on. It's a nice song. And they're all singing it. Like, they knew it. Now, imagine, again, what were the mores? Um, the biggest AM radio station in Los Angeles in the 1960s was KHJ, 9th Street KHJ, right? KFWB came later, KHJ, KRLA, but then KHJ eclipsed them. The Rolling Stones came out with a song called Let's Spend the Night Together. Let's spend the night together. It was not allowed to be played on the air. It was banned because it was considered off-color. 
and a generation later, I want your sex is the hottest song for 14-year-olds. I mean, you understand what, what's going on is that, that even in the 60s, there was still an ethic that governed sexual relations. By the time you get to the 1970s, that ethic is gone. And the girls that I'm speaking to who are 21st century young women, there are no ethics, there's no mores, there's no rules. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. There are really no rules anymore. So I said to the kids, that means that whatever rules there are governing your sexual behavior have to come from inside you because there's no rules on the outside that govern how a good girl behaves. You have to decide what forms of intimacy you'll engage in and what forms of intimacy you're going to reserve for certain kinds of relationships which might come your way in the course of your lifetime. And that's the great sexual revolution. So the rabbi is talking in the late 1960s, 1970s about what is a Jewish response to that circumstance. And he's talking specifically to these questions. First of all, couples who ask, when is premarital or non-marital sexual relations acceptable? Sex in marriage is obviously something which is, uh, which is celebrated by the Jewish tradition. But what about sex before a person gets married or outside of marriage in some way? A second kind of question are kids in the 1960s and 70s who were saying, why do we need to be married at all? Who needs that piece of paper? That was the language. Why can't we just live together and love each other and be happy together? Who needs the institutional imprimatur of getting married? That was a second set of questions. And a third set of questions had to do with, um, with an attitude that was championed. And, and the funny thing is the rabbi quotes it, and I sort of wonder where he found it. He quotes, he quotes the great Hugh Hefner. <laughs> you remember Hugh Hefner? Is he still alive? Yeah. Was he ever alive? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> what page you want to know? <laughs> There's no pictures. I'm sorry. It's just the words. Oh, 162. He says... In its bluntest form, the new morality is spelled out by the publisher of Playboy magazine, uh, Hugh Hefner. He says Hefner's magazine are significant elements in our mass culture. It sells over three million copies a month and is read primarily by college students and young people. Hefner puts it this way, listen carefully, quote, sex is a function of the body, a drive which man shares with animals like eating, drinking, and sleeping. It is a physical demand that must be satisfied. If you do not satisfy it, you have all kinds of neuroses and repression psychoses. He's a psychologist too, Dr. Hefner. <laughs> Sex is here to stay, he writes. Let us forget the prudery that makes us hide from it, throw away all those inhibitions, find a girl who is like-minded, and let yourself go. Unquote. And then the rabbi proceeds... One of the typical cartoons in Playboy depicts a boy and a girl locked in amorous embrace, during which he cries out, why talk of love at a time like this? This cartoon portrays Hefner's counsel of cultivated coolness to the other. So the sexual revolution comes along in the 1960s and basically destroys the structure of values and mores that govern human sexual relations and allows people free expression of that part of themselves. And they come to the rabbi and ask, what are we to do with this? And what does my tra tradition teach me about this? And that's what the essay in front of us is about, okay? Let's stop for a minute. Any questions? Questions, comments, concerns, counter sermons? So far, so good? There's one more piece of this which I want to add, which is not explicit in the essay, but something that I've been thinking a lot about. <clears throat> so I'm going to warn you now that on Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to be talking about the rabbi's philosophy. So you may hear this again. So as soon as you walk out the room, forget you heard it, okay? One of the features of modernity, of living in the modern world, is our sense in which we displace God. The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche begins his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, with a very arresting image. He has a man, a, a madman, running through the streets of a village, screaming out, God is dead, God is dead, God is dead, and we killed him. And what he means by that, of course, is not that God is dead, God isn't dead, but, but modernity has this idea that, that we don't need God anymore. We don't need God to govern our world, we'll do that ourselves. We don't need God to tell us what to do, we'll do that ourselves. 
We don't need God to take care of us. We'll do that ourselves. And we take the place of God. And part of that is a process by which all the things that were once held as sacred, the things that were mysterious, the things that were taboo, are now demythologized. They're, they've taken out of the sacred and made ordinary. Just take a couple of little examples, and then we'll take the one at hand, right? Sort of the little examples. When I was a kid, uh, the Vietnam War was going on, and, and uh, like most kids, I was you know, violently against it, because I really didn't want to have to go there. And, uh, and, and I joined all of these protests, and the protests were directed first at Lyndon Johnson, but most primarily at Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon became an object of real derision for us. And I remember a conversation with my dad, and he said to me, I don't like Mr. Nixon's policies, but how can you talk about the President of the United States that way? Right, the question is, sorry? Does the President of the United States deserve respect? Is there something awesome, elevated? Is there some reverence that is due, if not to the man, at least to the office? At least to the office. I mean, I'll give you a, the worst example is that I had a poster in my dormitory room when I was in college, and I, I it showed Mr. Nixon sitting on a toilet, <laughs> right? And, and the notion was, he's just a man like the rest of us, and not even that much, right? And that, now the, 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 so my dad says, it's like, you don't do that. That's not acceptable. You know, Franklin Roosevelt had all sorts of peccadilloes, but nobody would have talked about Franklin Roosevelt that way, even his political enemies. But by the time of Nixon's administration, we were able to look at the president and deride him in ways that no one ever had thought of before. The whole notion of the presidency lost its reverence. The flag lost its reverence. I remember there was a time when Abby Hoffman, the, the, the revolutionary, appeared on Dick Cavett's television program wearing a shirt made out of an American flag, and they wouldn't show it on the air. They fuzzed it out. You, you couldn't see his shirt. And, they, and he explained, He's wearing a shirt which would offend many of us. But you know why that happened? Why? Because people realize the government's blind to us. Well, that's a problem. So it was a problem the government... And the, and no, no, you're right. No, no. And the institutions of the, of the government, they're lying to them. Yeah, but the government lied to you during the Second World War too, but you lived with... It was a different type of lie. No, it wasn't a different type of lie. It was the same lie. <laughs> it's that you guys had a different attitude when you heard the lie. Right? All right, now, so... So Abby Hoffman wears a, wears a shirt made an American flag, and they won't show it on American television because we had reverence for the flag, and this was irreverent. It was disrespectful. And I remember some years later, the girl who's Miss America showed up on one of the nighttime talk shows in a miniskirt made out of an American flag, and she was proud of it. We'd lost the reverence for the flag. We lose reverence. Now, you're right. There are reasons for this, right? There are reasons for this. There's, a, there's a, an article on NPR this morning about Ireland um, and the church in Ireland. The church was, Ireland was once the most Catholic country in the world, and now it's not. And, and they're talking about how that happened. And part of it was because of the scandals in the Catholic church, and part of it was just an attitude among a younger generation to not take the church seriously. And now it's a very unreligious, very irreligious country. I want to suggest to you that the same process goes on here. That one of the reasons that, one of the reasons that sexual relations were taboo is because there was a certain reverence for it. There was a certain reverence because this was, this was the most intimate relations that people could have because this was the source of new life in the world. There was a sense of, that it needed to be held in privacy. In privacy. And suddenly, you have the de-sacred, de the, the word is desacralization, making something less sacred, moving it from the sacred to the ordinary of sexual relations, and they become very ordinary. I mean, so, in some ways, it's kind of, it, there were certain words that I was never allowed to say in the home I grew up in. Now, if you turn the television on, you hear those words every three seconds, right? There were certain there was certain language. There were certain ways of dress. I remember, you know, th th there, were things, there were things in the old days called men's magazines, which had women in scantily clothing. If you want to see those same women, open the, the LA Times. The ads, 
in the LA Times are racier than the, I mean, you know, Victoria's Secrets makes us, there's a desacralization of sexual relations. And that's the second thing that the rabbi's taking up. Because one of the themes, we're talking about this on Rosh Hashanah, that the rabbi is trying to work on in his philosophy is the question, what's sacred today? Where do I go to touch the sacred? To touch that which is powerful and inspiring and gives energy to my life, that which is of ultimate value and needs to be treated with reverence. What's sacred in life? And what he's taking on in this essay, in a subtle way, is not only the ethical questions of when is sexual relations acceptable and appropriate and when are they not, but the other question of is there anything sacred left in sex? Anything reverent left in this? Or has it become just common every day? And the irony, of course, is that whereas the rabbi is quoting Hugh Hefner, because Hugh Hefner, when he wrote this article, published a magazine which was considered racy, by today's standards, Playboy magazine is rated PG. <laughs> you know that. Any child who knows how to use the internet can, can find hardcore pornography in exactly three seconds. And they do, all know how to do it. They all know how to do it. And sometimes you do it by, I, this is crazy, we did it by accident once. My son was doing a report for his fifth grade class. And he wanted to know, he wanted to know the dimensions of the White House. So I said, go online and find out. He said, where will I find it? I said, I don't know, go whitehouse.something, see what you get. So he typed in whitehouse.com. Don't do that. Whitehouse.com is not Whitehouse.gov. Whitehouse.gov is where the Obamas live. Whitehouse.com has scantily clad ladies and German shepherds and chipmunks and horrible things you don't want to see. And I, and I remember, I remember I, I, it, it took me exactly eight-tenths of a second to get from my seat at the dinner table to the nook where the computer is to push the button and turn off the screen because I didn't want my 12-year-old my son looking at the stuff that was on that screen. I didn't want it, but it's there, it's that quick, and any kid knows how to find it today. In other words, the desacralization and, and, and made or, think, the process of making sexual relations ordinary has come to the point where pornography is available in all moments and in all places and all the time. And this is part of our culture. So now the rabbi is going to ask the following questions. First of all, can we talk about this? Second of all, what's the Jewish attitude towards sex in general and the body? And third of all, what are the answers to these questions? And that's what I'd like to get to next, okay? So this was all by way of introduction. David, you have a question? I don't want to derail this. Oh, go derail it. <laughs> It's a very interesting question. And, and then the, media, the only thing that comes to is about the media. You know, uh, I just got a hold of um, uh, Cynthia Lewis's book, uh, Main Street, uh, which uh, I understand next to the Holy Bible was on every, in every home. It was right. Popular. <laughs> right. You know, um, anyway, yeah, no, it's a very interesting question, which we don't need to get into. But why it was that have, it, 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 there were previous moments in human history when there was an overturning of values. But such a mass overturning of values, such a massive social change happens in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Technology is one reason, it means it spreads. There are other reasons as well, but moments, why this moment in the culture gives us these changes. Let's not go there tonight, let's, 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 let's pick this back up. All right, number one, can we talk about this stuff? I'm sorry, Ron. Some of them. Some of them. Right. Right. 
You're right. Me, me, me is not a Jewish value. That's contrary to Jewish values. So to the extent that the counterculture, the hippies, were self-directed and hedonistic, that would not have been a Jewish value. But you also have, out of that movement, comes in the environmental movement. The whole, first we called it ecology, and now we call it the environmental movement, right? And that came out of that same counterculture. People who said, industrial progress is not always progress. You remember, at a certain time, the picture of a big factory with a smokestack pouring smoke out was a symbol of power and progress and jobs. And, and, and for, then we said, wait a minute, where does that smoke go? We breathe that stuff, right? Okay? So the, the environmental movement is a product of that counterculture. It began to question the values that we had been raised with. That's, that's, that, I could argue, is an ethically positive kind of thing and something that is consistent with Jewish values. The, the sense in which um, the, the feminist revolution, I, I would think, is, is because it, it opens the potentiality of women to express themselves and their own individuality and creativity is also something consistent with Jewish values. So not everything in the counterculture is contrary, and not everything in the counterculture was good, and not everything's good, not everything was bad. It's, it's like every other human invention, a mixed bag. Okay? Dan. And contrary to popular belief, Yaakov, uh, uh, Yaakov Litan yeah. said that Hatsumir is here, he was here after Hatsumir is here. No intimate sex because pregnant girls make lousy clothes up. Right. Well, so that's a, so, so you were more interested in the movement than in women, and that's why the movement's not doing so great anymore, you know? <laughs> Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about these three questions. So question number one, the rabbi says, can we talk about this stuff? And he says, we need to. First of all, because it is such an important topic in the culture. And he says, more than that, the, the, the notion that sex is somehow unholy, that the body is somehow unholy and therefore out of bounds for religion to, to talk about, that it's somehow inappropriate for the synagogue to talk about, is a, not a Jewish idea at all. That's a Christian idea. It's a Christian idea born from a school of Greek philosophers who were assimilated into Christianity. They were called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics basically posited the idea that the body and the soul make up a human being. But the body is evil and the soul is good. The body comes from the devil and the soul comes from heaven. And that the body and soul are at war with each other and so in order to exalt the soul, you have to repress the body. And this is a fundamental idea that's at the heart of Christianity. And because of that idea, you have this notion that sex is allowed, but only for, means of, only for the purposes of procreation. That sexual pleasure is somehow suspect. It's the work of the devil. That sexual desire is the work of the devil. And you end up with asceticism, which is the denial of the body as a religious expression. There is a reason why Catholic priests aren't married and practice celibacy. Because the notion is that, that a priest, a pri because in order to exalt the soul, you cannot indulge the desires of the body. That's not a Jewish idea. The Jewish idea is very contrary to that. The Jewish idea is that body and soul are both creations of God. And therefore, they are invested with good and with evil. It's all a question of what you do with it. Every expression of the body by itself is morally neutral. It's a question of what you're going to do for it. So, for example, wine. Wine can turn a human being into an animal, or wine can be made into kiddush into a symbol of the shared life of a community, of a family, of a circle of friends and loved ones who are sharing holy moments. Food can turn a person into an animal, or food can be an opportunity to gather and share life together at a feast, at a, at a suda, a simcha. Money can turn a person into an animal, or money can be made into tzedaka made into, into charity, into, into the work of justice in the world. And sexuality, similarly, can turn a person into an animal, or sexuality can become a symbol of a deep and intimate relation between two loving human beings. It's all a question of how it's used. So for the Jewish tradition, 
Biology is morally neutral. Biology can be made into a symbol of spirituality. Everything biological about us, eating, drinking, money, sexuality, can become a symbol of that which is the highest among us or that which is the lowest. It depends upon the ethics to which it's applied. And so the rabbi says this is absolutely something we can talk about because the Jewish tradition has a very strong idea about this. But the Jewish tradition understood something about sexuality which is not commonly talked about in the culture, which is that we are a whole human being, body and soul, and that sexuality is part of relating to another person. Sexuality, as it's expressed in a relationship, is part of that relationship. If the relationship is whole, then sexuality can be part of that relationship. The problem happens when the relationship is not whole and sexuality becomes part of it, then sexuality becomes something exploitative. Let me tell you how I put this to the kids I teach. I'll say to the kids, the Jewish tradition had a very powerful insight. Very simple. The most intimate physical relationship should be reserved for the most intimate spiritual relationship. The most intimate physical expression of closeness should be reserved for circumstances in which there is an intimate, personal, and spiritual relationship. And I will say to teenagers, and I've said it lots of times, and they don't like to hear this, you're not ready for an intimate spiritual relationship. You're not ready for an intimate spiritual relationship for a very simple reason. Your, your body is so powerful. Your body is so filled with energy, powerful energy, that you can't tell the difference between a real spiritual relationship and a spiritual relationship you wish you were having but you're not really having. You can rationalize anything. You can rationalize anything. And therefore, because you can't tell if this is a deep spiritual relationship, you're not ready for those intimate levels of physical relationship. Not until you get to that level, you gain that discretion, that judgment. They don't want to hear that, of course, because they want to be told they can do whatever they want. But then you talk about, well, what happens if you enter into an intimate physical relationship without having a concomitant intimate spiritual relationship? I ask the girls, have you ever gotten too close to a boy and then discovered he doesn't really love you? How does it feel? And to one, they'll all say, it feels like I've been used. I say, isn't that an interesting language? I've been used, which means what? That you thought you were a person in his eyes and discovered that you were a thing, that you've been turned into a thing. And being turned into an object, a thing, doesn't feel good because it doesn't acknowledge your personal value. It doesn't acknowledge your uniqueness. It doesn't acknowledge your preciousness. That's the betrayal that comes when you admit sexuality into a relationship that's not also intimate spiritually. And that's the danger that you run in these relationships. So the rabbi talks about in the, in the essay here, and I, I hope you read it. Have you, have, have you read it? If you're going to read it, it's actually very wonderful. At the end of the essay, he answers the questions that the... Um, that, 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 our, you know, that, that the, the moment puts to him. And he talks about this sort of wholeness of body and spirit, that the Jewish tradition imagines that being alone is a very difficult way to be, and we enter different kinds of relationships, but there's one special, very special kind of relationship between two people which is intimate and responsible and trusting and close. And when, when that relationship happens, Sexuality becomes a beautiful symbol of that relationship and the Jewish tradition celebrates it. In relationships that don't have those qualities, that don't have those qualities, sexuality becomes a, an exploitation, a person using a person. And that becomes very problematic because it reduces a human being to a thing. And that's contrary to the deepest ethics of the tradition. Let me just read you a a short section of this because it's quite, um, it's quite wonderful. If I could, if I, can I do that? He talks about, first of all, he, he talks about, um, I've got to find the section I want to read. I've got a bunch of them here that I outlined because I like them a lot. Okay. He 
He's talking about um, why people don't enter those kind of relationships, why those relationships are difficult. He says, the feeling one discovers in love of another entails compassion, literally the capacity to suffer another's pain. To love and be loved is to be willing to be open to the hurt of another and open one's own hurt to another. There is risk in such self-disclosures. There's a vulnerability in these relationships. Who can hurt us more than the one to whom we've revealed our vulnerability? The stranger cannot hurt me. Toward the stranger, one can play it cool. Out of fear, we prefer estrangement, emotional distance in the midst of physical intimacy. Not lust, but fear may rationalize sex without love. It is easier to love the stranger than the neighbor. Only toward the latter is the clause as thyself added. Without the self-disclosure that is part of the process of self-revelation, there is no other with whom to relate, but painless sensuous experiences will not overcome the, em the emptiness of insularity. Now, what does he mean? He says, if, if we say to the person, and, you know, go and find that intimate relationship. But there's something scary about those intimate relationships. Because the moment you become intimate with somebody, you can be hurt. And so what happens is we, we recoil from those relationships out of self-defense. And you recoil out of those relationships out of self-defense, you end up in a lonely state. And so many people will, and kids especially, by the way, will seek sexual, sexual relations as a solution to that loneliness. I ask the girls, he betrayed you? And they'll say, yes. I'll say, well, why'd you go to bed with him anyway? Or why did you allow him to get that close to you? Well, I thought he liked me. You thought he liked you? You're a smart girl. You know who likes you and who doesn't like you. And she'll say, well, I felt nice when I was with him. I say, you felt nice when you were with him? That's okay. What did you feel? And she'll say, I thought he was really with me, right? I thought he was really with me. So I said, when you discovered that he wasn't really with you, why didn't you get out of there? He said, well, she said, I didn't want to be alone. I mean, there's a, you see the, 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 the dynamic going on? So here's what, what the rabbi is going to say to, the, to, this, to this generation is, what's missing from your formula of free love is that it's not free love, it's free sex. What you've done is freed love, freed sex from love. And when you free sex from love, you don't end up with lots and lots of wonderful sex. You end up with loneliness. You end up with a culture of people who are unable to relate to each other, unable to open up to each other, unwilling, un impatient to take the time to build those kinds of relationships. And in the end, that terrible sense of I've been used, of I've been used. So the argument in the, in the essay is to recover that fusion of love and sex, which is really the way that the Jewish tradition understood this, because there's a fusion of body and soul. You can't divide the person body, you can't put your soul on a shelf and go make love with your body. It doesn't work that way, he says. If you do that, you end up with a deeper sense of loneliness than what you started with. And that ends up being the real curse of this sexual revolution, is we end up with a lot of people having a lot of sex and feeling really empty about it. And that, I think, in many ways really is where we've come now in the 30 years since he wrote the essay. Let's get a couple comments and talk about this a little bit. Myra. There was a popular song written, I believe, either the late uh, 40s or early 50s. It may have been Cole Porter that wrote Body and Soul. Yeah. And one of the lines in the movie was, I am all for you, body and soul. Right. Was it, was it Hoagie Carmichael? Okay, there you go. Right? So, so but the, the, the question of... Um, the Cole Porter song, which I think is, is really the song, is a song that he wrote called Don't Fence Me In, <laughs> right? Which, which I think in so many ways describes, you know, the, the, 
this culture of individualism, right? The boy who comes to see me, and he says to me, I'm having a, ser- a terrible problem, Rabbi. I said, what's the problem? He said, I've been with this girl now for a couple of years, and I really, really love her. I said, wonderful. And I really, really want to marry her. I said, even better. We're really good together. Great. He says, I only have one big problem. Every time I think about asking her, asking her to marry me, I wonder, what if tomorrow I meet a better one? <laughs> no, 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 this really happens. This really happens. And I tell you know, so I ask him, tell me what this feels like. And he, just, you know, he says, you know, we met and we've been together, we have a wonderful time, but you know, sometimes I wonder, like, what, what, what if there's somebody even better for me out there? And I tie myself to her. You see what's going on there? So I say to him, you're right, you're not ready to get married. You're not mature enough. You're still, a, you're still a child. You're a little boy, right? You're measuring a woman by some sort of criteria, and you're shopping. And you wonder if tomorrow the object will go on sale. You'll get a better deal for a less price, right? And, 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 and that's what happens. What happens is they, they enter into these consumer relationships, right? Go online and look at J-Date, Right? They're advertising what they're looking for. I want a low mile, I want a low maintenance, low mileage, late model <laughs> with nice headlights and a good trunk. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're shopping. It's, and he doesn't understand what an intimate relationship means because he's sizing up this girl based on a series of criteria and he wonders if he could get four more checklists off of his. You see what's going on? Don't fence me in. Don't tell me what I have to do. It's all about me, and I'm not going to be regulated. I'm not going to be claimed by a relationship. He's not ready to get married. That really happens. And that really is, I think, part of what's frustrating in the culture, is a sense of individuals, individual monads, they call them, individuals sort of circling around each other, bumping into each other occasionally, but unwilling to find each other's souls and commit to each other. So one of the things I say to couples, I had three couples today getting married, so I had a long day today. And I explained to them, you're going to sign a ketubah. You know what the ketubah says? I accept upon myself responsibility for all that you need in the world. I said, are you ready to say that to somebody? Are you really ready? And, you know, each couple said yes, so I said, okay, I'll marry you. But you understand the, the power of that statement. That is such a powerful statement. It's not about me and my satisfaction. My satisfaction comes from my ability to bring, make you at home in the world and to bring you what you need in the world. And as you grow as a human being, I'll grow as a human being. That's my need. That's, what I, that's why I'm entering into this relationship. That young man wasn't ready. That young man wasn't ready. And that, that seems to me to be part of the culture. That seems to me part of the, part of the individualism that blocks the relationship of soul to soul and leaves them with these empty body-to-body contacts. Yes, please. Yesterday I saw a documentary at the Lemley called The Lost Key, yeah. and it deals with this subject. It's a Jewish-themed movie, and it's a rabbi who is a psychotherapist and deals with sexual matters, and the emphasis was on em- um, intimacy, yeah. exactly, and as the Torah spouses it and what we should learn from it. And he dealt with several couples yeah. in three different languages. There was Spanish, English, and Hebrew spoken, um, and many individuals who were asked questions about how they see sex today and what, um, how they feel about it. And some people were challenging him because it was pretty much dogma at times. But he really was actually quite fantastic, and there was, it was extremely thought-provoking. And I think, that, and we wanted to discuss the movie afterwards because it was, it had so much value in it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know whether anyone here has seen it. Okay. Do you agree with what I've just said? Yes. Okay. Good. Right. Yes. All right, so I... All right. So I, what, what, I would just really urge pe- people to see it. I wish every Jewish person would see it and just think, see what they get out of it because it was an important movie, I think. Thank you. Called the, what is it Thank called? You. The Lost Key? The Lost Key. And it's at Lemley. Good. 
or it'll be on TV soon. So, Le Lemley Films come to PBS. Okay, good, good. We'll, we'll take a look. We'll, we'll look into it. Please. I just want to know how how we can go about changing this situation, and um, and also. Well, first I'll put it, it's gotten much worse since the rabbi wrote the lecture, <laughs> that wrote, the, wrote the article, because he wrote the article in the late 1970s when yeah. Hugh Hefner's Playboy magazine was the raciest thing mm -hmm. available and when couples were still asking the question about premarital sex. That phrase, by the way, if anyone have a teenager or a 20-year-old at home, whisper that phrase and see how they respond. That phrase is so quaint. That's like phonograph. <laughs> that they, oh, that's what you used to have, right? Or typewriter, right? Or I mean, the, the, that the whole the, I'm, so, I'm not kidding. The phrase is quaint to them because the culture has moved so much, right? That people that, 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 that there's no more expectation that one will wait until one's married to have sex. It's expected now. Look, my my kids are single, so. They tell me that, you know, third, fourth date, you start sleeping together. If you don't, something's wrong with you. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and, that, and that, that, that's a sort of rule that's, you know, so it's, a, it's it, 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 the whole notion has changed so radically, even since the rabbi wrote the essay. Even since the rabbi wrote the essay. What he's not wrong about, though, is the problem, which is loneliness. That when you separate sex and love, and you cease to see the human being as a whole creature, body and soul, then you end up with tremendous loneliness. And I, I encounter this a lot in the counseling that I do with young adults. They get very lonely, you know, because of this culture. And it's very hard to engage in relationships because the people they meet are not interested in intimate relationships. They're, intimate, they're interested in quick sex, sexual contacts. And it becomes very, very discouraging to them. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, well. With so, how do you media, change it? Yeah, how to change it, especially when you have the media, and the TV. Uh, so, what I, what I, I I'll tell you what I do. So, I don't know if I have the right. I mean, I could give a fire and brimstone sermon, and no one will listen to me. Of course, all the parents will shake their head, and all the kids will walk out of the show, right? Um, I, I try to talk to young people about their own sense of themselves, body and soul. And I ask them which sexual relations are right for them, are ethical for them, in, in a way that makes them feel whole as human beings. And I try to tell them that they have, they have my permission. They have permission to say no. To say no. I'm not ready for that yet. So what happens in this seminar that I do with these kids, they're 16 years old, is they separate the boys and the girls. First I'll talk to the boys and I'll talk to the girls. And I'll say to the boys, you know, try this. Next time you're talking to a woman, a female person, look them in the eye and not in the chest and uh, ask them, you know, ask them something about their lives. I said, let's practice this, guys. We're going to have lunch in an hour. During lunch, I want you to sit across from a girl in your class and look entirely in her eyes while you talk to her. Don't look down at her chest, right? And, and and ask her about what she learned in the seminar today. <laughs> so we did this, and all the girls come to me after lunch, and they say, what did you do to the boys? <laughs> Boy, they're like different men. They're different creatures, right? All of a sudden, we learn how to listen, right? And I taught them how to do a little bit of listening. And then I said, try this next time. Next time you're, like, you're really tempted like to touch, grab, kiss, tell a girl, I want to get to know you first. I want to get to, I said, you'll be the sexiest man in the class if you say to a young woman, before I start touching you, I want to get to know you. I want to know what you're about. I promise you, you, you won't be sorry. And I get letters back from boys saying, I tried your technique, Rabbi. <laughs> you know? But the idea is it's an ethic because I want you to see her as a human being and, not, and as a soul. I want you to know her soul before you crave her body. Now, I know that's really hard if you're 16 years old and male. By the way, I gave this talk, and I came down here to the shul to, to, for the rest of And across the street, there's a bus shelter across the street, and there's a big advertisement on the bus shelter. And for an entire year, the advertisement on the bus shelter was for a Beverly Hills lingerie shop. So there was a picture of a 16-foot woman on that thing, 
wearing nothing but dental floss. <laughs> and God had blessed that girl, Kanai Nohara. I mean, it certainly made me a more religious man because every time I walked out of the front door of the shul, I said, oh my God. <laughs> now, how am I supposed to teach boys to look a woman in the eye and talk to her soul if the whole culture is pressing flesh in their face. I mean, and you're dealing with, you know, young men who have no self-control to begin with. And we're trying to say to them, there's a soul, she's a soul, right? You know, again, I, I found my, when my kid got better at the computer than me, I once walked by. In the old days, teenage boys would keep dirty magazines in their, in their bed, you know, their mattress. Now it's on your computer, right? And there's a button they push and it disappears. All of a sudden there's Mr. Rogers or somebody. I walked by and he hit the button, but not until I said, all right, bring it back. I said, what's that? And he's really embarrassed because he's a very sweet kid. He said, well, Abba. I said, okay. I've learned something. Number one, you're straight. Number two, you're healthy, right? And number three, let's talk about this. So I sat with him and I said, I said, what do you, what, what do you make of that? And he said to me, she's so hot. I said, not dressed like that, she's not. You know, she's, I said, but is she nice? Nice and hot. No. She's, like I said, I've taught you your whole life to, to see the soul in a human being. Does that young woman have a soul? He said, yeah, she has a soul. I said, do you think that picture demonstrates that she has a soul? That's what makes it wrong. I mean, what, what makes those pictures wrong is you're training young men to see only the... And that's something that... I, so I'm trying to train these young men to, to see the soul. But it's very hard. And then I talk to the girls and I say to them, well, they don't like what I say. First I say to them, if you dress in a way which says, look at my body and don't look at my soul, don't be, don't be, don't be surprised if men stare you in the chest whenever you talk. They say, well, that's not fair. I said, I'm not trying to tell you not to be fashionable. I'm telling you to be reasonable and understand who you're dealing with here. Okay? And number two, you have to help me teach these boys to be civilized. But you have to look at them and see that they have a soul too. A young man also has a soul. It's under a lot of junk, but it's in there, I promise you. <laughs> and help that young man understand that he has a soul by talking to him about what's in his soul. And if you learn how to have relationships soul to soul, I promise you, you'll have a happier life and a happier sex life. So I get a lot of mail back from kids who have heard that seminar, and they tell me that, that, you know, that, that, it, that it, it, it gives them a rubric for trying to engage these kinds of relationships through college, and that, that it's been helpful to them. So that's my way of doing it. The rabbis is similar. What the rabbi is talking about is to see people whole as body and soul. Hi, Phyllis. Hi. Um, I, I, you're only talking about boys in this way, but my experience is that girls also use boys, and I wonder okay. if you discuss that too, because yeah. I remember talking with young women who talked about finding a guy to lose their virginity with. Right. And, uh, well, you want to find a certain kind of guy, you want him to be nice to you, you want to like him, yeah. you don't want to love him, but you want to like him enough, and, you know. Right. And I think that's using men also. I, right. And you haven't addressed that. Do you address that when you talk to those girls? Not as much, because it's not that, that's not the, the presenting problem. But sometimes it comes up in conversation. Sometimes it's, you know, hooking up. And I'll talk to them about what hooking up means to them. Yeah. Yeah, these girls have talked to me about hooking up, which means, which means, you know, having a, having a, having, well, a one night stand. They don't have nights. They have a, you know, they don't have a place to be. And, and they're talking about that. And they're talking about, you know, just finding a cute boy, someone. And, and, and again, so the question is like, what are you doing here? What are you doing to yourself? How are you, what position are you putting yourself into? Um, with girls, it, it, it's, it's very complicated. One of the things that makes it complicated, we've talked about, is fashion. Right? I'm a rabbi now in a synagogue, you know, and we have bar mitzvahs on Shabbos morning, and you watch what 13-year-old girls wear to a bar mitzvah? I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, so you look at it and you say to yourself, hmm. So not only is she wearing that, she's wearing it to shul, and her mother <laughs> let her wear it to shul. And you wonder, like, so there was an article in the New York Times about a, a, the mother of a 13-year-old who was invited to a party. And she wanted to get her kid a dress, so she takes her, and it's in New York City, so she took the kid to Bloomingdale's. And she writes in the article, I only have one question. What do hookers wear? <laughs> if this is what they sell to 13-year-old girls, like, you know, what do professionals wear? Because the high heels, the very short, very tight, 
very sexualized look of a 13-year-old girl. And then I'm always wondering about, all right, I don't blame the girl. She's a kid. What does she know? But is there no adult in her life who understands how she's being looked at and that she isn't emotionally ready to be looked at that way? You know, if a, if a, woman, a young woman wants to dress that way because she wants to attract certain kinds of attention, that's one thing. But she, this young girl is not ready to, and I, I watch sometimes, it's, you know, I sit on the beamers, so I can see everything, you know. And you see a, a, an older man, a man, man, looking at this girl, and you say to yourself, is she ready to be, to be does she understand, I mean, it, it's a very scary thing, and what does it do to her? That really worries me. So part of this is the exploitation that's imposed upon her by the culture. And that really worries me as well. They, they do use boys, it's true. And sometimes they do it, they don't know that they're doing it, and they do it. And that's something we talk a lot about. All right, hang on a second. Let, let Ma, Ron, Ronnie, can we let Malka speak? Thank you. I think there's, there's another factor involved. It's a very complicated yeah. question. Yeah. But one of the aspects of the question has to do with the relationship of the parents. And sometimes I think given the worries of the parents, which you articulate correctly and clearly, uh, means that parents have to be more articulate about their relationship and its meanings. Because it just doesn't occur to the youngsters. The youngsters know buy and sell. The youngsters know a notion of success and they're looking at sexuality in the very same way. And no one is, they're assuming that they shouldn't and that it's clear and that kids should know better. But it's a wrong assumption. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I'm, and I don't think, I, I, you know, <laughs> parents, es, parents' ethics are always a generation late. So the ethics of contemporary parents belong to the time the rabbi was talking about. You know, and, and the, they're not ready for the ethics of what's going on right now. Um, lots of parents don't understand what their kids do on the internet, for example. And lots of parents don't understand the kinds of interactions that go on in schools and in, among kids. So I, it's a very, very important point, and, it's, and, and, and they're surprised when you raise it with them. We've had a number of times when we've had parenting workshops here at the synagogue, and someone will raise these issues, and you hear this sort of gasp when these things are raised because these parents, like, never, it never occurred to them. Really? My kid? No, not my kid. Not my kid, right? And that, that's a very troubling, that's a very troubling thing. That's a very troubling thing. Yes, please. How do you feel about what's happening now with this university student of 19 who had to um, deflower a 15-year-old girl oh, and it's yeah. part of the culture? And how, what is the impact long term on both of them and all of us watching in horror that this could yeah, actually you, be you happening? You know what she's talking about? So there's a, a very high-powered prep school in New Hampshire called St. Paul's. And, yeah, and, and in St. Paul's there's a, uh, there's a custom that a certain week of the senior year, it's called senior salute or something, and senior boys invite girls to go for a walk, take a, have a kiss, and sometimes a lot more. And there's a culture among the boys about how many sexual conquests you can have. And so there was a case in which, an, uh, he was 18 at the time, an 18-year-old senior invited a 15-year-old freshman girl uh, up to the roof of a building and then into a storeroom. And now the stories diverge because she claimed they undressed and, she, and he had sex with her even though she protested. And he claims she undressed and they touched and felt but didn't have sex and she never protested. And it's a very convoluted story. It's going to be difficult for this jury, even though the prosecution's done a fine job, it's going to be difficult for this jury, I think, to find him guilty, because I think there's a lot of reasonable doubt. However, something else is going on, which is very clear to everybody. The whole case is being played out on the front page of the New York Times, which means that for the rest of his life, this boy is a rapist. No matter what the jury says, he, he's, a he's going to be a freshman at Harvard if they haven't revoked his admission, right? But if he gets through Harvard and he decides to go to Harvard Law School, everybody gets Googled these days. 
and the Harvard Law School admissions is going to look and Google him, and guess what's going to be the first story? All this rape stuff, and they're going to say, we don't want this guy on our campus. If he gets to Harvard Law School and manages to get through Harvard Law School, right, when he takes the bar and goes and applies for a job in a New York law firm, they're going to look him up. In other words, this boy has been stamped. This is the scarlet letter. This boy has been stamped for the rest of his life. Because there are certain things on the internet that you can get repressed. But you can't repress three weeks of front page stories on the New York Times. This boy has been stamped for the rest of his life. So whatever the jury decides, and from my reading of the article, I'm not in the courtroom like you, I'm just reading the articles, seems to me he probably did rape her. He's probably a really not a very nice kid. However, he probably, you know, there's enough reasonable doubt to keep him out of jail. The internet will have convicted him and he'll have to bear that for the rest of his life, which is a very interesting circumstance, a very interesting circumstance. What? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the number of conquests, but you don't know how much of this stuff was his real, his real stuff or how much of it was his bravado. And, you know, it, it's a very difficult case. I mean, you know, he, you would have thought that being at the world's most powerful, that a kid who's gotten into Harvard, who's smart enough to get through prep school and get into Harvard, would be smart enough to have some discretion. To have some discretion. But it, it's, that's exactly right. So there's ego and self-importance. All right, exactly right. So welcome to a new world, right? Welcome to a new world. David. When I'm, uh, first I'm sitting here thinking about my granddaughter who's turning 13 soon. She turned 13, my wife just, that's how in touch I am. And uh, what I'm hearing in you is the, is the elegance of being able to continue to ask questions of the young person to get past the facade, to get past the surface, to ask the question that allows that young lady, for instance, you know, to tell you to be a person just like, or, or the young man to be a person just like you and me, just as we've always been, but to somehow to give them the respect, regard, uh, and patience to ask the question, to find the question that allows that person to look inside their own souls and come up with the answer, as opposed to lecturing, dictating. And I, I, it really struck me the eloquence uh, and the elegance of the questioning that you were describing, that you do with young people. Thanks. And I find in that um, guidance. Many years ago, i tell you how I start this thing. Many years ago, uh, I was in Israel, and a friend of mine um, who has relatives in a very, very, very orthodox Hasidic community invited me um, to an engagement party. Um, a tanayim is what's called. So I went down to B'nai Brak, which is the super, super, super ultra-orthodox neighborhood, right? And my friend meets me there, and we go into this big hall, right? And, and, here, and, and, and here's what happens. Um, the men are on one side of a mechitza, and the, and the women on the other. And in the middle of the mechitza, there's a break in the mechitza, and there's a table, okay? And here's what happens. Um, the girl is the daughter of some one of the rabbis in the community. The boy is the son of one of the rabbis in the community. The, it is an arranged marriage, right? And they've met once before over a dinner, just like this, basically, across the table, and they agreed to marry, right? So the boy gets marched in, and the girl gets danced in, and they sit across this table from each other, and the rabbis go through the hocus pocus, and I'm watching this. I got close enough to watch her eyes, and she's terrified. Here is a young woman who has grown up her entire life among women, right? She, she's one of nine or 10 or 11 kids in this family, right? And raised by her sisters and her mom and her grandmother and uh, raised in women's school, girls' schools. She's 17 years old. Um, she'll be married, you know, just before her 18th birthday when she graduates high school, right? Here is a young man 
who's been raised among men. Right? He was in yeshiva his whole life, raised among men. He's never been on a date with a girl. <laughs> she's never been on a date with a... The only man she's ever been close to is her dad, and that was only on Friday night when he blessed her. The rest of the time, even daddy was away. She has brothers, but they live in yeshiva. The only other brother she has ever had who's been close to us because she's in the middle of the nine or ten kids is the, the babies, so she's held the baby. But once the kid's two, three years old, he gets whisked away. And they're about to get married. They're about to get married. Right? And I, so I said, you know, and the kids are listening to this story and they're like aghast, you know. That terrible. And I said, yeah, imagine that, you know, and they're going to get married and they're going to be together for the rest of their lives, have babies. I said, you know what? I think you guys have it harder than them. I think, I honestly think kids, you guys, kids, you have it harder than them. I'll tell you why. Because they live in a world where the rules are perfectly clear. They live in a world where they know exactly what's expected. They are told from the day they're little kids, they have lots of role models to see. They know exactly how they're supposed to behave toward each other, what they're supposed to expect of each other. Right? They know what to expect. You have no idea what to expect. Now, how many of you have ever been on a date with somebody and it went really differently than you thought it would? <laughs> Every hand goes up. Because there are no rules anymore. There's simply no rules anymore. Right? And then some of the kids will start telling me stories, right? You know what sexting is? Anybody happen to know what that is? Yes. That is when one young person will send pictures of their genitals to other young people on their telephone. I'm not kidding. This actually happens. I'm not, I didn't make this up. And, and so this girl tells me, I went, on a, I, I went out with this guy. We had a great time. Went to the movies. We had a little ice cream. It was fun. I thought it was cute. He gave me a kiss goodnight. He said he'd like to see me again. I thought it was great. Then an hour later, he sends me a picture of his uh, bris. <laughs> and she said, like, what? <laughs> like, there's no rules. You live in a world of chaos. You have no idea. This is the state of nature. You know? So I said to the kids, the difference is they live in a world where the rules are from the outside. You live in a world where the rules have to come from the inside. Now, how can we help you build some rules that will keep you whole and protect you and make you safe and make you happy to be you? And that's, that's the conversation. That's how it starts. And the kids say, gee, that's, I never thought of it that way. They say, yeah, well, you have to have the rules. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything's right or wrong, but I'm going to ask you lots of questions about how do you think that feels? And there's always some boy. You know the boy. Well, you know, rabbi, <laughs> you're a rabbi, what do you know? And you're an old rabbi. <laughs> you know, these, there's some really hot girls in the class. And I'll, it's great. And I'll say, any guy here willing to let their sister date him? <laughs> and all the other boys turn and look at him in a new way. They say, how would you guys feel if your sister dated him? And so this guy sitting next to him was about three times his size. and said, you touch my sister, I'll kill you. <laughs> I mean, it was like, all of a sudden, I said, why do you feel that way? Don't you know that every girl is somebody's sister? And like this. <laughs> and suddenly the whole thing becomes a different. They, they just don't think this way, you see? Because the culture has hypnotized them. Go for, you know, indulge your desires. You know, you know let, let it out. Let it all out. Otherwise, you're, you know, you, you indulge your desires. Why be frustrated? Why be the last one? I want to finish tonight with just one more right reading. The, the rabbi ends the essay with a beautiful... You want to say something, Janie? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see you. Oh, I apologize. Okay. I didn't see you. I didn't see you. If I, just quickly, I think one of the biggest problems today is so many people don't have the idea of respecting others, respecting themselves. You talk to a parent, and I would call parents because the kids, the girls are dressed totally... Janie is a school counselor. Right? Yeah. At Birmingham. You still at Birmingham? No. They forced me to retire. All right, I'm sorry. No. Janie was a great school counselor <laughs> right. before they forced her to retire. But I'm going to be teaching in Santa Monica for a couple months. Good, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. But, you know, the parents, you call parents and say, your child is on the computer on these sites that are not acceptable. And either the parents, I've had parents say, my child's a straight A student. He would never do that. And I said, check the Facebook page. The next day, the kid is banned from Facebook. Facebook, but as, I mean, the parent would never say, they were just 
so busy defending their child is always right. right. And the kids don't learn to respect rules. And it's really a very scary thing that we, I think there are rules, whether it's respecting ourselves and our souls and having other people respect is so important and yet so many, so, uh, many people are not learning this and their parents aren't teaching their children. Yeah, that's what Malka said before about yeah, you have to exactly. pay attention to the parents and ask yourself what's going on in that relationship. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the psychology of the parent. Right? What's the psychology of the mother who sends her kid to a bat mitzvah dressed that way? What is she trying to say about herself? You know, and that's a, that's a scary thing as well. Well, we've had that here in Shul, by the way. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but uh, no one here, oh, yeah. I promise you. Oh, yeah. But we've had moments where the mother was dressed more scantily. Oh, yeah. And, and look, I'm a religious man. I look at that and I say, thank you, God, you know, for making us in your image. And they you know? don't realize that the bima is seven steps above the you know, first 30 rows. You know, ma Adonai, how great are your deeds, O Lord. Your handiwork <laughs> brings me pleasure. What am I supposed to say? Good God, you know. There was a time, can I tell a bad joke? There was a time when a woman like that came up for an aliyah and she didn't know what to do. And Yossi said, touch the Torah with your tzitzis. <laughs> so she, she said, no, 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 not that. <laughs> she said, I, I mean, it happens, it happens. Even Yossi was embarrassed. And you know, it's hard to embarrass Yossi Dresser. But the poor woman, I mean, that's the best part of her. So what am I going to say? You know? Oh, yeah, poor Yossi. Yossi tries so hard. But, but, it, but you know, what are you going to do? I mean, come on. You know, so the, the, the woman, there was a, the, the, and that, the, the woman standing there. And, and I mean, and, and there was one of the sisterhood, I think it was Jeanette Salomon, right? It was just a lovely, lovely lady. And she was the sisterhood lady. And the woman didn't have anything on her head. So Jeanette's walking up with a doily to put on her head. I just, Gornish Helvin. I mean, <laughs> you don't have enough doilies in the whole synagogue to cover with. Leave it alone. Her hair is the least to what we have to wear. So when you signed up for rabbinical school, yeah. did you ever in a million years think you'd be talking about these kinds of subjects and have these issues to deal with? I just want to thank you for providing a moral compass for these kids that you speak to every year, for those of us who are parents, those of us who are older, and for the community at large, because it is such a confusing world out there, and I really am grateful that you're able to you know, to address these issues that are so important to all of us, as Rabbi Schulweis did in yeah, his yeah. time. Yeah, but to, to help us, you know, have raised our kids and to help a lot of kids and, and parents out there. So Thanks. this must be something you never in a million years thought about. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was married very young. I was married at 25. Um, it, it's, what's interesting, what I, what, the reason I think this is important is because this is an area where I think that the Jewish tradition's attitude toward body, toward sex, toward love, toward relationship is exactly right and is an exact, it is an exact, it's such a wonderful healing of what I think is broken in the culture. Do you know what the word is in Jewish, in Hebrew, for an intimate married relationship of wholeness? Kiddushin. Now think about that. Kadosh, holiness, is the highest spiritual virtue we have. It's the highest expression of our godliness. Kiddushin is what the tradition called two loving partners who hold each other close and care for each other and share life with each other. Now that to me is such a powerful indication of what is right you know, and what we're aiming at, you see? And so instead of yelling at kids and saying, you know, you're evil bunch of teenagers... Let's give them an image of what they can aim at. What would it mean to aspire? What would you need to do now at age 16 so that sometime in your early adulthood you are living in that kind of relationship of responsible, trusting, loving, sharing, giving, caring, joyful relationship, sexual relationship, personal relationship. What do you need to know how to do now in order to get to that point. That, that's what we're trying to do, give the kids. Give them an ideal. Holiness is an ideal. This is something Rabbi Shoyce used to talk about all the time. Think of mitzvah not as commandment, but as an ideal. 
I want, to, I want to aim toward that. So the mitzvah of Kiddushin is, how am I going to live my life so that one day I can have that? And by the way, let's go one more step, because we didn't get into this tonight, but marriages have ups and downs. Mine does. Everyone's does, I imagine. Right? There are moments when my marriage is Kiddushin. It really is joyful, caring, fun, trusting, responsible. And there are moments when it's, uh, take out the garbage, you know. Go watch your television program and get out of my face. There are moments, there are moments when it's not, and, and we have to aim at that. We, the question also in, a, in, in any marriage relationship is how do you restore it to, a, to, a, to a, a, a connection of souls and not just a connection of furniture. And married people become furniture in each other's lives. Right? You become my easy chair. I forget to cherish you. You forget to cherish me. We forget to nurture each other. And so the question is, how do you restore that kind of thing in a marriage? It's a very powerful question as well. Let me read the end of this essay. I think it's the, end, the last section of the essay, I'm sure, was a sermon because it's too beautiful just to be an essay. And if it's on page 167, if you have the book, and he's talking about marriage. And he's, asking, he's answering the question which was asked so many times in the 60s. And it's asked a lot now as well. Why get married? What does marriage, the wedding, add to a loving relationship. If we love each other, why do we have to get married for? If we love each other, what does the piece of paper, the ceremony do? And he's answering this, and he answers in a particularly beautiful way. Let me read it, and we'll comment it as we go through. He writes, for Judaism, marriage is not a menage a deux, which means uh, an arrangement of two people, right? Did I say that right? A private arrangement. The marriage vow which declares Hareat Mekudeshatli, be thou consecrated to me, is not complete without adding the clause Kidat Moshe Israel, in accordance with the law of Moses in Israel. Along with the two persons covenanted to each other is a third presence. That witness is the Jewish community and its ideals of divinity. The nexus, that's the connection, between the couple and the cosmos is the community. So what's he saying? The difference between you two living together and you two standing under the chuppah is that the chuppah is surrounded by your family, by your community, by the Jewish people, by all of the Jewish people through history, and by the cosmos. And that standing there under the chuppah, you're establishing a connection, not just between the two of you, but among all those layers of relationship. All those layers of relationship. And that's why we deem it kiddushin. Here's the next line. Ready? If willful celibacy is in some traditions a religious statement that transcends the needs of this world, marriage in Judaism is a political declaration in which two people in the presence of a minion affirm the community and the world. In certain traditions, and he's talking about Christian traditions specifically, to establish, to declare oneself celibate is the way that one builds a relationship with God. Not in Judaism. Not in Judaism. Because in Judaism, to declare yourself celibate is to first of all say that I'm not a body, I'm only a soul. Which is, to us, not true. And second of all, to say I'm celibate means that I refuse to share myself, body and soul, with anybody else. I refuse to enter into relationship. The priest is father. Right? Father McCarthy, Father O'Leary, right? But he's no one's real father, right? He's pretending to be a father. He's playing the, the role of pastoral father, but he's really not anybody's father. He's never been in the relationship of being a father. I mean, there's a wonderful Gemara, there's a wonderful Talmud that says a rabbi cannot adjudicate certain cases, particularly difficult criminal uh, capital cases, unless he himself is a parent. Unless you have a kid in the world, you don't understand what it means to sit in judgment on somebody else's kid. And sometimes communities even said that rabbis can't function in certain roles as rabbis unless they're married, which I think is a very interesting thing. First of all, I'll tell you one small thing, which you'll all laugh, right? Nobody could call himself infallible who's married. <laughs> right? Only a man who's celibate and not married can say, I'm infallible. Right? You know... Anyone who says he's infallible and is married says, you know, okay, Mr. Infallible, where are your car keys, you know? 
All right, Mr. Infallible, you forgot to zip your pants. I mean, Mr. What kind of infallible? If you're fallible, the first thing marriage does, the first thing marriage does is make you very humble. You realize very quickly, I am not perfect. I am far from perfect. Right? That's the first thing you realize. Okay? So, and the second thing is, I have to learn how to listen. And the third thing, I mean, there's all kinds of things. That, so what the rabbi is saying is that in Judaism, celibacy is the opposite because it's, it's an enforced loneliness. That's the opposite of holiness. Holiness begins when I open myself to the world and I affirm the world. And the greatest affirming of the world is engaging another human being in a full relationship of responsibility. And then if you're so blessed to bring children into the world. That's the greatest affirmation of the world. I always say this to parents on the first day of school. I'm going to tell them next week when they start school. You don't know this, but you're all believers. You may tell me you're an atheist, but you're here, you're not an atheist. You know why? Because if you're an atheist, you wouldn't have had a kid. You're having a child as a statement of your faith in the world after you're gone. And that's faith. That's not belief. That's not a fact. That's a faith. Bringing a child into the world is your faith in the possibilities of life and the possibilities of the world and the possibility that the world will be humane enough to sustain the dreams of your child. It is the greatest act of faith a human being can have to bring a child into the world. And that's what the rabbi says. So let me just finish the sentence again. Because Marriage in Judaism is a political declaration. Political meaning it's done in the public, in front of other people, in which two people in the presence of a minion, usually many hundreds more than that, <laughs> affirm the community and the world. We, are, we belong and we believe in the possibilities here. So the ritual act wherein the groom breaks the glass, you know, at the end of the wedding, dramatizes the fragmentation of life and the imperatives to respond to that condition. The broken vessel symbolizes war and poverty, sickness and hatred. The breaking of the glass means that the bride and groom, as Jewish and Jew, blessed with love, accomplish, acknowledge the couple's task to enter the world, making whole that which is broken and binding that which is bruised. Why do you break a glass at the end of the wedding, says the rabbi? It's the promise that now that we've found each other together as a couple, we devote ourselves to the great task of, the human, of human beings in the world, which is bringing tikkun olam. Ours, our, ours is a marriage, ours is a life that has a purpose. And the breaking of the glass is a symbol of that shared purpose, which is the shared purpose taught us by our Jewish tradition, by our community. We, we accept the community's mandate the community's imperative, this is what we got to do. Consecrated love has cosmic meaning. That's a great sentence. Consecrated love means it's sacred because it's soul to soul, has cosmic meaning because the marriage of the couple is the first step of tikkun. I always say this to couples. I said it to you, right? When you break the glass, it breaks into a zillion pieces it could never be put back together. That's the world outside. You found each other. See, the world can be made whole again. This is the first step toward wholeness. Consecrated love has cosmic meaning. It is to salvage the sparks of divinity lodged in the husks of the world. That's a Kabbalistic idea, that there's light everywhere, and we have to find it. Here's the last paragraph. The ultimate task of life is to overcome separation without absorption of the other to be two individuals bonded to each other, but to remain two individuals, but to be bonded to each other, but to remain two individuals. Such a union, respectful of the other, requires wisdom. Quote, therefore shall a man leave the house of his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's from Genesis. This new oneness refers to the union discovered through dot in Hebrew knowledge. Dot, in biblical Hebrew, means both to know and to love. Now, that's a beautiful idea. The word dot means to know and to love. And think about that, that juxtaposition, right? To know someone, to really know them, to know what hurts them and what they need in the world is to love them. And to love them is to know them and to promise to know them, to know and to love. To love is to know and to know is to love. Such a unified wisdom of love informs the Jewish attitude towards sexuality in its dialogue 
with the dualists, those who would separate body and soul of ancient and modern times. The task of life is to go and to know the other and to love the other, and that is the greatest satisfaction a human being can have, and that is the circumstance that is celebrated through the joy of the body, the joy of the soul. Thanks for listening, and uh, have a wonderful rest of the summer. Thanks so much.